I knew they put this TED there for a reason. A few months ago, I went to an event called the Health Gadget Hack. Now, these hack events are becoming more and more popular, and I'm sure some of you know about them in any case. They are problem-solving events, where the objective is to use technology to solve real problems that people have. So the health one, as the name suggests, uh, had a lot of people from the NHS who had problems in their everyday working uh, practices. And they wanted to team up with people who may, could maybe come up with ideas on how to solve their problems. So they'd be computer scientists like myself, engineers, and other technology experts. So at this event, I got talking to somebody from the Welsh Ambulance Service. And one of the problems that uh, he talked about was sort of related to that uh, sound that we just heard. I think we, we're all, in our minds, imagined a car crash the ambulance has been called, so the paramedics arrive at the scene. What if the, the person who's been injured in the crash needs a life-saving procedure, but it's a procedure that the paramedics don't normally carry out? It's something that they only rarely need to do. So the problem they had was how to maintain the skill set of their paramedics in order for them to successfully perform that procedure on the injured person. So this is how this project all started off. And when that pro problem was explained to me, I immediately thought, this is a great project for applying virtual reality to. And that's my area of specialty. So I I'm uh, based at uh, Chester University. My background is with computer graphics, and that includes using technology like virtual reality. And the picture you see here is from my lab. And Tom there, one of my PhD students, is wearing a head-mounted display, so such, as, such as this one. I guess this is what you think of these days when somebody says virtual reality. Give them a headset. If I put this on, I can no longer see you. That's maybe a good thing. <laughs> and I can be immersed in a purely virtual world that the computer's generating for me. And it's tracking me as well, so as I look around, what I see is being updated according to the direction I'm looking at. And if it's done really well, I start to get a sense of presence. I start to believe that I'm actually in that virtual world and no longer in the real world. These also have headphones on them as well, so I can use audio. Uh, so as well as my sense of vision, I can use my sense of hearing to enhance that feeling of immersion in the virtual world. So these are the technologies that I'm using regularly. Uh, in the picture, Tom is wearing the same headset that I brought with me, but also on that uh, picture, you can see that there's a small device attached to the front of the headset, uh, and that's a little infrared camera. And we can use devices like that to track where your hands are. So if I hold my hand in front of the headset, the infrared camera is actually detecting where my fingers are, and if I move my fingers, I can have a virtual computer-rendered hand, which is completely replicating what my real hand is doing. That makes it more natural if I'm interacting in the scene and picking up objects and other devices in the scene. What that doesn't do for me, though, is uh, really use another one of my human senses, and that's the sense of touch. I would like to have either force or tactile feedback as I interact with objects in my virtual scene. So this is why I have a picture of this device as well. This is something that can do that for me. This is um, a stylus, and it's on a sort of robotic arm. And inside this device, there's a clever arrangement of uh, cables and pulleys, and there's a little electrical motor which pulls on the, uh, on the cables. And the net effect is that I get a force feedback on this stylus that I hold in my hand. So I could you know, prod a virtual object, and I could feel the resistance of that object if I use a device like this. So all this technology is now becoming cheap. 
and widely available. I'm sure many of you here maybe even own a headset such as this and are using it at home uh, for playing games. You could go into the center of Chester where there's a, a shop set up to give you VR experiences and they give you this type of technology to interact with. So this technology is becoming more affordable and it's also becoming more powerful as well. So my research is perhaps taking this technology and leveraging it for a more serious game than just an entertainment game. And what we wanted to do with the paramedics is provide them a way of maintaining their skills at particular procedures using virtual reality. So the project that we are currently doing is called ParaVR. At the end of the, um, the hack event, which I mentioned earlier, we had to pitch our ideas to a team of uh, dragons and we were lucky enough to, to win that, and they actually gave us some seed funding to develop the idea a little bit further. So what I'm going to tell you about uh, in the next few minutes is our current status of this project. It's still early days, and we have a lot more to do. But enabling the paramedic to have a VR headset, to have it in his, the ambulance depot, so that whenever he's got some spare time, or she's got some spare time, they can pop this on, and be immersed in a scenario to apply a particular procedure to uh, somebody who's been injured. And they can practice and maintain their skill set at doing that. So that's what ParaVR is all about. So there, there are lots of procedures in the paramedics' uh, armory. Some they do very often, but there are others which uh, are not done that often. And one example that was given to us is something called a needle cricothyroidotomy. So the, the name makes it sound much more complicated than perhaps it is. And this is a procedure that's carried out when somebody has had the airways blocked, they can't breathe. You have to get air into their lungs as quickly as possible. And what they do is use a special needle device. Uh, it's a sort of needle and catheter combined. Uh, they have to in, in stick this needle into your chest cavity. And they use landmarks, in this case it would be the ribs, they count down for the third rib, and they have to get the angle of the catheter right and the needle, and insert the needle so it penetrates the chest. As soon as it does that, there's a little valve embedded in the needle which re is released so the air pressure can escape. You then hold the needle in place, carry on inserting the catheter so it penetrates into the lungs, and then you can remove the needle and you've got the lung um, accessible via this catheter so that an airflow can be uh, restored to that patient. So the, the paramedic needs to remember how to do that. He needs to remember what landmarks he's looking for, how much uh, he must insert the needle, and then how much further the catheter needs to be inserted. And this will be in quite a high-pressure scenario because there's uh, somebody in front of them uh, who's, who's dying because they can't breathe. So they need to do it quickly and effectively. So this is the procedure that we've actually started off the, uh, the para-VR project to try and address. Give them a, a VR tool to practice doing this particular procedure. So here's a screenshot of the, uh, of the application. I mean, it is the sort of thing that you could do with a mannequin. I'm sure you've all seen uh, these mannequins that... Uh, Different medical procedures like CPR can be practiced on. And these mannequins are quite good, good at that. And there are mannequins available for different needle type procedures. And you can stick needles quite happily into them. But there are problems with mannequins. And you know, if you continue practicing sticking a needle into the same mannequin, that area of the plastic skin, it wears out, needs to be replaced. So there's quite a large cost of consumables involved with using mannequins for training. And also, you, you're not really feeling that you're at the scene of an accident because you're in the, uh, the training centre with a mannequin on the table practising the procedure. So you're not getting the same pressures as you would do if you were in the middle of a road uh, with a crash car on one side and uh, the police coming up on the other side. And you know, it's a much more intense uh, experience. So, so that's something that VR can do for you, I think. It can make it more like that, as if you really are out in the field having to do this procedure for real. Now, so I've got a little video clip on the next slide, which is an early prototype of uh, the VR experience. 
And you, know, you really need to be looking at it through one of these, because then you're immersed in 3D, seeing the, uh, seeing the scene around you. Uh, it's not quite the same looking at a video on the screen, but it'll give you a flavour of what we are, we're all about. So we let this video clip play. And one thing we could do in VR is we can make the patient or the injured person transparent, so we can actually see their, their bones and skeleton. So when we're counting down for the third rib for our entry point, we can actually see the ribs to start with. And then as you get uh, more expert at this procedure, we can turn off that transparency. So you just uh, have to identify the target on the skin and can't see the ribs. So I picked up the needle. In the VR scene, I see my hand picking up the model of the actual needle device I would be using. What I'm doing in reality is holding the stylus of this device uh, so that when I press that needle into the, the patient, I actually get the force feedback. I feel the sensation of the needle going through the skin and the, the popping sensation that you feel when you do that. And I'm wearing the headset. I've got the headphones as well, so I can play the audio that you will get on a roadside scene and the sort of noises and commotion that's going on around. So, so you get to feel more immersed in the environment that you really are in the scene. And the other advantage of using virtual reality is that we can uh, give you instructions as well as what you need to do. That could be via audio or visual cues. And, uh, and that's something you can't really do with a mannequin type uh, solution. So, so it's a work in progress and you can see problems there. We haven't actually matched up the skeleton exactly with the, the patient yet. But that will all be done uh, as we develop this into uh, the final uh, product. So that's one area, and, and it's quite an exciting project. It's, it's a nice project to be involved in. I've been working in that, the health domain using VR for many years. Uh, another project that we currently have on the go is the video you see in the center here. Uh, this is something that we're doing with the stroke unit at the County of Chester Hospital. And if you've had a stroke, uh, one thing that can be affected, affected is your cognitive abilities. So everyday tasks that we just take for granted become very difficult to do. You have to relearn how to do them, such as putting bread in a toaster and then buttering the toast after it's popped out. So we've got uh, a system that gives scenarios like that to the patient so they can practice doing it in VR. And uh, they can do it from their bedside. They can do it as often as they like. Uh, so you know, a patient who's recovering would typically have many hours on the ward when they're doing nothing. So instead of that, they can, uh, we can give them a headset and they can start to practice these activities of everyday living and, and uh, relearn how to do them in VR. And there's a few other projects that I've done over the years as well uh, illustrated on this uh, slide. Uh, some are using quite low fidelity technology solutions, such as an iPad, and in the top right, that is actually a, a neurosurgery, a brain surgery tool that we developed that just needs an iPad. And so again, we stick sticking needles into, uh, into the head in this case, but we do it all via the iPad interface. Also, uh, the bottom right is interventional radiology scenario, where, where we have a more realistic uh, patient and we put in guide wires and catheters into a patient doing virtual fluoroscopy scans on the, on the computer monitor. And also, anatomy education is another obvious thing that we can do with, uh, with VR. And we've got a virtual dissection laboratory. Uh, again, another project that we're developing that hopefully the Chester Medical Institute will, uh, will start using. So there's a lot of potential for using VR in the medical domain and providing these serious games that can benefit and add value. And we've got to add value to the, the hospital or the NHS because this technology can accelerate the recovery of a patient. So if a patient spends less time in the hospital bed, get home quicker, that's not only good for the patient, but it's good for the hospital, because that saves a lot of money. The clinicians can have their time freed up, to perhaps spend more time with uh, more serious uh, complaints that patients may have, because uh, the other patients are going off into a VR world, doing their rehab or whatever, and uh, recovering quicker, and they get home quicker, and have a more engaging, more enjoyable uh, recovery process as a result. 
So I think, uh, if, unfortunately, you have to go to hospital in the next few years. I think you will see more and more of this type of technology being there, available for, for you to use. And some of that technology, hopefully, will have come from Chester. So thank you very much.